Hello, I'm Cindy McCain, and I'm delighted to greet you virtually today and welcome you to the Florida International University State of the World Conference. Like you, I wish we could all be together in Miami again this year for the State of the World Conference. I enjoyed being there in person last year, and I look forward to a time when we can gather again at FIU for meaningful discussions on so many global topics. Today, I have the honor of announcing the McCain Institute for International Leadership's new Kissinger Fellow for 2021, former Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. As our Kissinger Fellow, Julie will work with the McCain Institute over the coming year to highlight the importance of American leadership in the Indo-Pacific region, as well as seek collaborative solutions for fighting human trafficking internationally. Drawing from her experience as foreign minister and analyzing the current trends in the region, Julie will craft a framework making the case for greater American engagement in the Indo-Pacific and how a stronger alliance amongst the US, Australia, and like-minded nations can bolster security, commerce, and human dignity. She will also work on a strategy on how countries in the Indo-Pacific can best contribute to the security of each other, not only in terms of military power, but also in the realms of intelligence, law enforcement, new technology, and international coordination. Lastly, and most certainly closest to my work, Julie will contribute to the McCain Institute's newly announced Global Consortium of Prosecutors. The Global Consortium is being established in order to share best practices in prosecuting human traffickers and to give us an edge over the perpetrators that don't recognize national jurisdictions. In addition, as our Kissinger Fellow, she will focus on global supply chains as key points of vulnerability in the battle against human trafficking. It is vital that governments, the private sector and consumers are aware of this vulnerability and mitigating steps are taken. The United States and Australia have adopted strategies for combating human trafficking in their spheres of influence. Unfortunately, human trafficking is now on the rise. It is therefore important to identify the next steps that both countries can take to further advance the efforts to combat human trafficking and to provide relief for its victims and punishment for its perpetrators. I am delighted to welcome Julie Bishop to our 2021 Kissinger Fellowship, and I look forward to her important contributions to the McCain Institute's work on combating human trafficking and her timely work on the strategic issues in the Indo-Pacific. As chair of the McCain Institute, I am thrilled to have Julie with her wealth of expertise and talent join forces with us for the coming year. Now you will have an opportunity to hear former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop and Ambassador Mark Green discuss in greater details her plan for her year as a Kissinger Fellow with the McCain Institute. Congratulations and let's get to work and thank you. It is always an honor for me to participate in an event that honors John McCain. He was a big part of my life, a patriot, a great public servant, an extraordinary human being, the kind of leader that appears all too rarely in our time. So the Kissinger Fellowship at the McCain Center is a very moving symbol for me because Senator McCain stood for the strength of America and for the role of America, especially in the Pacific. I'm delighted that Trudy Bishop is the Kitchener Fellow for this year and maybe for longer. It's a tremendous project to work on the Indo-Pacific relationship to, uh, to the United States. I have known her since she was Foreign Minister of Australia. And Australia is an absolutely key factor in the security 
and possible progress of the Indo-Pacific region. It's important that we address this as a joint project. Let me thank you for giving me this opportunity to express my admiration for the McCain family, for the importance of this project, and for Julie Bishop's role in it. Thank you very much. Well, Mark, it was great to hear from both Cindy McCain and Dr. Henry Kissinger. Uh, I want to get your reaction, uh, first of all, to the remarks made by Dr. Kissinger. Well, you know, Dr. Kissinger is a remarkable figure historically, but more importantly, he's a remarkable figure today. A and he continues, I, I think, to lay out for all of us the challenges and opportunities in, in not just American foreign policy, but foreign policy uh, writ large. Tough acts to follow, uh, obviously, for all of us. But uh, at, at the McCain Institute, I can tell you, we are thrilled about our association with Dr. Kissinger. Back in 2015, it was really the relationship and shared values between John McCain and Dr. Kissinger that led us to create the Kissinger Fellowship as a way of, of projecting those values and principles and making sure that they are at the center of important foreign policy discussions. And, uh, you know, we have had uh, a, a lot of fun with the Kissinger Fellowship. Kurt Campbell was our previous uh, fellow. And of course, now he's part of the Biden White House, the NSC. And uh, I, I wish I could tell you that it was the McCain Fellowship that launched his career. Not true. But uh, that obviously has been a great relationship. But I have to tell you, we're absolutely thrilled uh, that uh, Julie Bishop will be our McCain Fellow and Kissinger Fellow for 2021. And so uh, I think this is fantastic. It's a great it's a great new chapter. Well, Julie Bishop, congratulations to you and welcome uh, to the McCain Institute. Uh, I, I know the McCain Institute, just hearing from Mark, is so pleased to have you as the next Kissinger Fellow. What do you intend to do uh, during uh, your year? Uh, in this position. Well, first, thank you, Ambassador Green. Thank you, John. And I'm delighted to be announced as the Kissinger Fellow for 2021 at the McCain Institute. And first, may I take this opportunity to pay tribute to the late John McCain, uh, with whom I held many discussions when I was Foreign Minister, whether it was in Washington or in Canberra. He was always prepared to sit down with me and talk about all things foreign policy. And I really appreciated that opportunity. In fact, I had the honor of uh, introducing him as a keynote speaker at the US-Australia Leadership Dialogue in Washington one year. And he had a deep appreciation and understanding of the US-Australian Alliance. And I have the greatest respect for the work that he did and the contribution that he made. Um, you didn't always have to agree with John McCain, but no one could ever doubt that he was a person of great integrity and honour. And uh, likewise, I pay tribute to the great Dr. Henry Kissinger, to whom the world certainly owes uh, an immense debt of gratitude. Many years ago, a legal colleague gave me a copy of his book, Diplomacy. This was back in the early 1990s, and I was absolutely mesmerised by it and of course have read all his subsequent books, um, including on China. And I also had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Kissinger when I was foreign minister and visiting New York. And he was always very gracious with his time and shared his deep and substantial insights and perspectives on the world. So I thank him for his ongoing and continuing role uh, in foreign policy. As a Kissinger Fellow for 2021, my goal is to make the case for a more effective American engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and to demonstrate how stronger alliances and relationships between the United States and, for example, Australia and other like-minded nations can really bolster uh, the peace and security that we need, uh, economic progress, sustainable economic progress, as well as human dignity. And I think we need to reforge 
uh, the Pacific Island alliances and partnerships, and I'll be particularly fo focusing on that, in the era of uh, great power competition. And the Pacific is an increasingly contested space, um, a region of strategic importance to both our nations. And I think we need a strategy on how like-minded countries can can contribute to the security of each other, not only in terms of uh, military power, but also in the realms of intelligence and law enforcement, technology, international coordination, or homeland security efforts, as well as um, trade and commerce. Uh, I think a key focus of my research will be the challenge to governance from the modus operandi of uh, Chinese companies and government representatives, which has the potential to undermine governance standards, particularly in Pacific nations that are vital to attracting foreign investment in those economies. And my third theme is on combating the scourge of uh, human trafficking. Both the United States and Australia have adopted strategies for combating modern slavery, as it's now called, in our spheres of influence. And while this scourge is still on the rise, it's vital that um, best practices on how to fight modern slavery, human trafficking, um, illegal labour practices can be shared. And I'll be focusing on international human trafficking and I'm delighted to be able to support the Global Prosecutors, Prosecutors Consortium that was recently announced by the McCain Institute. So a lot of work ahead of me, but I'm certainly looking forward to it. Well, all of those themes are so topical, and it's a perfect segue uh, to our discussion about each of those issues. And let me start off uh, by asking each of you uh, about Indo-Pacific relations, and specifically the nations in the Indo-Pacific region. Do you believe they have a shared commitment to uh, what's known as the rules-based order, or are they looking for alternatives right now? Uh, with so many changes that we've seen take place in this region of the world over the past few decades? Well, perhaps I'll lead off on that one if it's okay, John. I think, uh, look, the rules-based order is that is that network of um, conventions and treaties and alliances and institutions underpinned by international law that has evolved um, ever since World War II. And the United States has been the instigator and defender and guarantor of that rules-based order. And it was originally, of course, designed to repeat uh, the horrors of World War II to ensure that there was not another global conflict uh, in the uh, decades and years following uh, the 20th century. And it's been successful to that extent, but it was also to guide the behavior of nations and towards each other. And the nations of the Indo-Pacific generally express strong support for the rules-based order, but that would have varying levels of commitment to taking action in support of that order. And I think developing nations in particular tend to have, well, weaker institutions perhaps, and are thus less able to develop strategies for supporting the rules-based order other than when it's directly affecting them. And they've always had perhaps more of an ad hoc approach to their engagement with the order. And I recall that I was very keen to remind leaders and policy making, uh, makers of developing nations that um, the rules-based order was to provide an opportunity for all nations to grow uh, subject to their domestic regulatory environments. Any breakdown of that order would most certainly be detrimental to their interests and that of all nations over the longer term. But I think the challenge, of course, is that uh, larger, more powerful nations are increasingly cherry picking that rules based order, um, complying with some aspects of it and not with other elements. And so I think it's time to reinforce the importance and the fundamentals of that rules based order, not only in our part of the world, but across the globe. Mark, let me follow up on uh, Julie's comments. Uh, and that is the role that the U.S. plays uh, in this uh, part of the world and the role that the U.S. plays specifically in strengthening the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Well, it, John, I, I think Julie has laid out very well the importance uh, of this work in that part of the world. You know, it, I mean, open any American newspaper on any given day and you'll see some aspect of, of the rubs and conflict that we have with China. 
Uh, but in the era of great power competition, it, it, it may be uh, emotionally um, uplifting to poke each other in the eye. It is hardly the basis of a sound long-term foreign policy. And I think what uh, Dr. Kissinger has been stressing, and you've just heard so eloquently from Julie, is that we have to invest in the system itself. And we have to invest uh, with those countries, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, to help build the capacity so that they can compete in and meet their own needs within that rules-based system. If we reduce our foreign policy to transactional, to one-offs, uh, any particular transaction may benefit the US or Australia or both, but it doesn't really lay the groundwork for those countries to meet their aspirations, nor does it really help reinforce the values and principles that are at the heart of our foreign policy. So really what we need to be doing with the Indo-Pacific strategy launched uh, nominally uh, under President Trump and, and I think picked up and will be, um, you know, will evolve and be projected under President Biden, is that we need to invest in capacity building. We need to invest in institutions of transparency. We need to invest in institutions that reinforce the rule of law. And then we need to go to our partners and say, look, uh, we want to help you achieve what you want to achieve. And then when you achieve what your goals are, we benefit because the system that is the key for our ability to advance interest and investment, that is reinforced. So it, it's making sure that we're in this for the long run. It's making sure that we walk with our partners to reinforce their capacity. And it's also, and I, I think a very good point that, that Julie made, it's also making sure that we're committed to the system itself of not simply those pieces which may be convenient in any particular uh, sector or issue area. John, mm -hmm. perhaps I could um, add a more specific point there. And I agree absolutely with what Marcus had to say um, about the support for the order that's needed across the globe. But, you know, specifically, the order can be strengthened in the Indo-Pacific by supporting these nations in their efforts to attract foreign investment and capital that they lack domestically to drive economic growth. And private capital, as we all know, tends to flow to environments where sovereign risk is lowest and where the strongest property rights are enforced and the like. And for many nations of the Indo-Pacific, corruption is one of the most corrosive features of their governments. It's endemic in some nations and that's a significant barrier to investment. So strengthening anti-corruption efforts, for example, including support for trafficking, uh, for tracking illicit um, flows of funds would be among the most um, valuable support mechanisms that the US and other like-minded nations could provide. So that's kind of the specifics um, in the in the general strengthening of the order that I believe is required. During the, the waning years of the Obama administration, uh, President Obama pursued the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And uh, in the uh, early years of the Trump administration, uh, that was an effort that was scrapped by President Trump. It, was this a mistake in your view, uh, Julie? Is this something that you believe should be picked up by, by the new Biden administration? Would this be helpful to the region in terms of expanding trade and, and uh, the efforts that you spoke about uh, improving norms and rules-based order in this region? Well, John, to be fair, in the 2016 presidential election, both candidates uh, were... Um, arguing against the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, perhaps President candidate Trump more vociferously, but um, we were disappointed that it wasn't a bipartisan um, effort and that the United States withdrew from the negotiations that had commenced under President Obama. And they were for a very specific strategic reason. Yes, it was a, a gold standard trade agreement, a free trade agreement, but it was also a hedge. And I think that nations of the region were deeply disappointed when the US decided not to pursue it. Um, to its credit, Japan, uh, Canada, Australia and others, Singapore continued with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and it is um, a highly effective um, trade alliance between some significant economies. We would hope that the United States would see an opportunity to 
come back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership or uh, TPP Mark II and uh, be a leader in this field. There's certainly an opportunity for the Biden administration. I know it won't be easy uh, within the United States, but we saw it as a great opportunity for like-minded countries to pursue um, positive economic outcomes and strategically, it sent a very powerful message to the region that the United States and its allies and friends were going to set the gold standard for trade agreements. And uh, that's what the TPP is today. And uh, the United States naturally should fit within it. What, what's your view, Mark? Do you believe that uh, this new administration will pursue uh, multilateral trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, I do. Uh, and, and, you know, I, a couple of things. First off, um, you know, America needs to be engaged, regardless of the issue area. Uh, if an administration doesn't support the terms of TPP or, or any trade deals that's being drawn up, they don't get better by walking away or not being engaged. The U.S. needs to be engaged and do what it can with its like-minded partners to shape deals and to shape frameworks because it can be done in a way in which all countries benefit. Secondly, I, I think from the American perspective, we make the mistake over and over again, assuming that a, con a case once made is always made. And I think over and over again, if you look at the polling in the US, we have lost the consensus around the importance of, of our dem democratic governance work and perhaps our trade work not because they aren't valid uh, areas for us to be engaged in, but more that we stop talking about the benefits that we get from that kind of work and how in the long run, if we have countries which are integrated in, in their outlook towards market-based economics, those are countries that are more reliable allies and partners in other realms as well. So I, I think the US, both sides of the aisle, really needs to spend time taking a look at what it is that we believe in. What are those principles and values that should be at the heart of our foreign policy and make that case over and over again? I believe in trade. I think that free and fair trade is something that benefits the U.S. and benefits our partners. We've made that case uh, on a bipartisan basis that succeeded. And then I think we stopped talking about it, stopped making the case, and when that happens, uh, other voices tend to shape the debate. And, and that's, uh, I think, a setback for everyone. Julie, what is uh, right now, how would you view uh, America's image in the Indo-Pacific region? What uh, is the U.S. seen as a trusted ally, a reliable ally? Well, um I, I think that uh, it would be fair to say that some countries are um, hedging their bets and uh, they are um, natural allies of the United States but they are concerned about the rise of China and the economic coercion that can uh, be imposed should they um, not agree or have their views not align with those of, of China and I think there's been um, an uptick in cooperation amongst um, alliance partners with the United States, uh, but I wouldn't describe it as widespread. I think the um, you know the quadrilateral security dialogue has certainly uh, been reinvigorated, uh, but I think organisations such as ASEAN, the Southeast Asian Nations Association, which is a consensus model is prone to be influenced by some nations that are deeply in China's orbit. And so I think that the lack of any significant and overt um, enthusiasm for the, um, for the United States um, goes to the fact that some nations of the Indo-Pacific have largely adopted a hedging strategy. Uh, in private conversations, I know that uh, nations are worried about the implications of uh, China-US engagement and there's an underlying theme of caution, if you like. And as China does show this willingness to uh, impose coercive measures, um, particularly economic coercion on those who it deems are out of line, uh, 
nevertheless, few would want to offend uh, the United States. So it's a delicate, delicate balancing act that I think some are finding difficult. And I know even in Australia, the discussion about uh, you know, whether one has to choose between being um, a friend and partner of the United States and, or um, an economic partner of China and gain some currency. I don't, I don't think countries are yet at that point about where they feel they have to choose, but they're watching developments closely. And should we reach that juncture, a choice will be driven, I think, by the decisions and conduct of the United States and China respectively, rather than by individual policy imperatives within countries. So, John, if I can pick up on that, you know, one of the things that I heard from my days as administrator at USAID, uh, and not just in the Indo-Pacific, but globally, when the issue would come up about uh, Chinese investment in a particular deal or a particular sector, in quiet moments on the margins, the conversations always came back to the same point. When you would ask a country why it was that it chose the Chinese model or Chinese investment, the answer was because you weren't there. Uh, what we have found over and over again is that the U.S. and, and our partners like Australia, we are the preferred uh, uh, partners, but that requires us to be there and be in the conversation. And I think for the longest time, we took too much for granted, and we weren't making those long-term investments in relationships and in capacity that are so crucial. I believe that if we are engaged, if we're present, if people know that we care and that we're involved, you know, not in not in every deal is the U.S. financing going to be at the core. But my money's on a market based entrepreneurial innovative economy such as the U.S. over a, a system which doesn't look at win win, um, you know, a point I'll make too, something that we developed in my days at USAID that proved very successful, because there's another piece to this. Sometimes countries and leaders will engage or, or take up a Chinese offer um, of financing, and they'll tell you they weren't entirely aware of all the details and consequences on the back end of that deal. Part of it is that we can make a big difference if we invest in our partner countries and helping them to develop the capacity to objectively uh, evaluate uh, propositions that are brought. And, and so what we have done is we created a mechanism for an independent evaluator, which a country can turn to, independent of the US government, as a way of analyzing uh, what the terms and consequences of a particular offer are. Again, in, in some cases, a country may decide that it's worth it and that they should go with, for example, Chinese financing. It's freedom of choice. That's their choice. But at least they'll understand what the consequences are. Uh, eyes will be wide open. And I, I think when eyes are wide open, those of us who believe in private investment, those of us who believe in trade, more often than not, I, I think we'll see that uh, our approach is one that prevails. Yeah, John, I, I think Mark has raised a really interesting point there. Um, what's you know usually described as a debt trap diplomacy where nations are promised um, infrastructure funded by the Chinese government uh, through loans. And when they're unable to repay the loans because they have fragile economies and fragile um, balances, then uh, there's often a deal where ownership or long-term leases revert to China. And we've seen this in our region, uh, you know, the debt for equity swaps. And it can be insidious, both economically and strategically. And, and this is a, a, an impact uh, that we're seeing with the Belt Road initiatives or, or funding that's now being labelled Belt Road. And this is the dual use facilities, another uh, concern that we have, for example, uh, China builds a significant new airport or port, um, often far beyond the uh, required capacity of that nation, and those facilities then become dual civilian and military um, uses, and that allows China to deny that it's um, establishing military bases in other countries, and it's not often clear that the leaders of those nations 
uh, where this occurs are fully aware of the implications of taking on these loans and the nature of the infrastructure. So it, it's not utilising uh, traditional foreign aid or development assistance to lift nations out of poverty, for example. So I think that's a very important point that uh, Mark has made. I'm so fascinated, Julie, by Australia's relationship with China. China uh, Australia is one of uh, the few countries in the world that actually has a trade surplus uh, with China, with, which is pretty remarkable from the US perspective to see that. And we see that in the past week, Australia's treasurer made some comments regarding uh, Australia's relationship with China in which he said that he wants Australia to have a mutually beneficial relationship with China. He wants it to improve after that relationship really has deteriorated over the past year. Do you see that happening? And can that happen to the detriment of the US relationship with Australia? Well, we are in a different position than um, the United States in the relationship with China, economically speaking, in that we have a massive trade surplus. And so much of our export income is driven from the sale of our commodities to China. That's currently um, a rather tense relationship because uh, according to the Chinese government, Australia has um, misbehaved in a number of ways. In fact, they leaked a list of 14 grievances that they had against the Australian government. And they related to security issues like um, our 5G network through to our foreign interference laws, through to the Prime Minister calling for an inquiry into the origins of the COVID pandemic and the like. Obviously things that displeased China and their response is to uh, directly or indirectly um, coerce our exporters into forcing our government to change its view. You know, so suddenly we find that our coal exports are no longer required and wine and wheat and, and it's not yet affected iron ore, but uh, the, the, the threat is there and it's quite overt. Uh, the Australian government is confident that we can continue to uh, supply high quality goods to the Chinese people and that the political tensions can be overcome. Uh, I know that China can take some time to um, come to any form of rapprochement with a country that it believes has uh, misbehaved. And uh, so we'll see how this evolves over time. But I believe that Australia will always be able to uh, balance its relationship with China with our deep, enduring and abiding alliance with the United States. I mean, <laughs> I used to be regularly lectured by my Chinese counterparts on the US-Australia alliance. It didn't bear any resemblance to the actual ANZUS alliance, the way they would characterise it. But nevertheless, uh, I was challenged on many occasions and would push back constantly by saying that this alliance is the bedrock of our um, our strategic security that the US and Australia go back uh, decades, generations, we fought side by side in every conflict uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, and that the ties between our nations are deep and enduring. That doesn't always go over well in China, but nevertheless, I think Australia has been able to uh, balance our economic relationship uh, with our enduring alliance with the United States. It's a question of how one can manage the tensions uh, that are evident between the US and China. And this brings me back to that point about um, whether countries are going to be forced to choose. I mean, there are some who fear a great fracture where the world will divide into two universes um, between the, the two great economies, um, where China will develop its own reserve currency, where it will develop its own internet and its own um, trade rules and financial rules and its own zero-sum view of the world. And Australia and other countries must continue to work with the United States and with China to ensure that that doesn't happen. Do you see that as well, Mark, that, that uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific region are indeed uh, moving in the direction of having to choose between the US and China, particularly in the area of technology? Well, it, it first, is a, as I said earlier, I think the importance is that we need to give them a choice. So first and foremost, it, the importance of engagement, which will allow for realistic choices. Look, you know, I, I think from the American perspective, the importance 
in our approach is, is to emphasize what the bargain is, what it is that the market-based Western approach to uh, investment and trade is versus that that we see coming out of Beijing. Uh, it, it, as uh, I used to say all the time, we believe in the journey to self-reliance. We believe in constructing uh, relationships and uh, investment in ways that help countries to rise from being donor recipients to uh, partners, co-investors, and in fact, partners in helping other countries rise. That's the model that we believe in. Chinese investment, not in every case, but in many cases, is the opposite. They look to build dependency. They hope that a country engaging with them will be locked in to that relationship and unable uh, either fiscally or politically or diplomatically to make choices. So choices don't bother us, but we want to make sure that we are able to provide a choice by being engaged and being very clear of what it is that we offer. Over the, John, the court, I, yeah, John, go ahead, I, you, you raised the technology realm, and yeah. I really do think that's where the choice is most likely to arise, most certainly in the short term, as the uh, decoupling underway could lead to incompatible technology ecosystems, if I can put it that way. And should China develop its own standards, for example, nations may well feel that they have to choose which best serves their needs. And of course, much will depend on you know, future technology breakthroughs and capabilities. And the United States has a massive advantage um, due to its long history of broad engagement around the world. But of course, none of us take anything for granted. And um, the United States must continue to lead in these fields. And um, I, I think that um, while I would describe the stance of many nations as hedging, they don't want to alienate either the United States or China, but they want to be able to balance the competing interests to their best advantage. And the challenge to US, its allies and like-minded, is to present the most attractive alternative. Well, that is a perfect segue to my next question, Mark, in terms of presenting an attractive alternative. Over the past uh, four years, we've seen the Trump administration really uh, take a hard line against China. It was one of those rare instances of bipartisanship in terms of foreign policy. Uh, you had Chuck Schumer, for instance, uh, urging the president to take an even tougher line against China. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you view the U.S. relationship with China proceeding over the next four years under President Biden. Well, it's been interesting to watch the confirmation hearings and Secretary Tony Blinken, I think, has been very clear. He actually paid tribute to President Trump, former President Trump, and saying, look, he essentially awakened the American people to the challenge that China represents and presents in the world. And so I think that's a very important positive contribution. I think President Biden also realizes that uh, it may be tempting for some on the left to simply push to turn back the clock and to go the, to where the world was pre-Donald Trump. That's not where the world is. The world has changed a great deal. China is, is far more awakened and far more engaged around the world. And so what we need to do is to take that awakening that I think President Trump uh, brought to the American people, and I think you'll see President Biden try to apply it in building new approaches and new uh, relationships. And, and so this is one of those rare areas where I do think you'll see a continuum in American foreign policy, uh, not a reversal, but standing on the shoulders of what President Trump did and looking to expand and extend it. And if, I, I, think, yeah. I think that um, from Australia's perspective, we're not expecting to see any sudden change in uh, US policy with regard to China. In fact, we noted the news today that uh, a, a Taiwanese representative was invited to the inauguration for the first time in, uh, in decades. And I thought that was an interesting um, signpost. Uh, but President Biden does, as I understand, have a past quite close relationship with President Xi, so maybe there will be more predictability to the relationship. 
but I wouldn't think that President um, Biden would want to expose himself to accusations that he's soft on China and failing to put the interests of US workers first, for example. But I, I think that um, from the Indo-Pacific perspective, the nations will be hoping that uh, US and China can find a way to resolve at least some of the tensions, particularly on trade. And, and, and others, including Australia, don't want to see any lessening of support for the rules-based order, um, including the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea as it applies to the South China Sea and the like, and how that uh, applies more broadly to territorial disputes. And I think arguably, um, if the Biden administration can find a way to engage with China constructively, uh, then that will be very well received in our region, although it is going to be a challenge given China's a much more assertive, indeed aggressive stance on international affairs under President Xi Jinping. President Trump, as you know, Julie, was uh, criticized often for uh, using tariffs uh, in, in terms of uh, his trade policy over the past four years. And we've seen China impose tariffs on Australian uh, products over the course of the past year. And I'm curious uh, to know as to whether you've seen these recent actions uh, against Australia, among others, uh, lead to an increased level of cooperation uh, between nations in the Indo-Pacific region? Oh, yes, I, I believe so. I believe nations are um, becoming increasingly aware of, of China's coercive tactics, and that means that they are more willing to engage and discuss um, these kind of issues, but again, as I, as I say, they <laughs> they they are hedging. They are hedging their bets. But I think there's um, an enthusiasm about the incoming Biden administration. I think that uh, we will see um, the dialogue involving the U.S., India, um, Australia, and Japan, the Quad, uh, perhaps become even more formalised. And uh, that will encourage other nations to perhaps um, consider a similar al alliance or dialogue. In fact, there is talk of the Quad being expanded to include more nations who are not in China's immediate orbit. So I think there's great potential for um, more connections and engagement uh, amongst countries who see the benefit in um, a democratic system, in fair and free trade, in greater global engagement. And um, I, I think this is a real opportunity for us to, dare I say, reset, but for um, the Biden administration to uh, deeply engage in our region and show leadership on the trade front. Uh, yes, we certainly did have our moments with the Trump administration on um, some trade and tariff issues. Uh, but um, I'm hoping that we will see a great deal of constructive dialogue in the trade arena with the United States, and that will certainly um, be met with great enthusiasm by others in the region. What's your view on that, Mark? Do you see perhaps the US uh, uh, perhaps resurrecting uh, or adjoining this Trans-Pacific Partnership that has gone on without the US? Or, or is that too optimistic a, a view in terms of what we can expect with uh, President Biden's trade approach to the region? Well, you know, foreign policy and the shift in administration isn't a light switch going on and off. Right. But I do think we'll see from the Biden administration uh, a, a, a regional approach, uh, a, a stronger uh, attention to ongoing relationships. And again, I'm one of those that believes that relationships should be at the heart of American foreign policy. It, there's no one event, no one issue that should define a relationship. It needs to be working together towards the shared values and outcomes that are at the heart of both systems. We are close friends and allies of Australia. Uh, we often disagree, but there's no one issue that destroys that relationship because there's so much that we have in common. I think building on those shared values is the key to success in the region because so much of the region does have those shared values. If we focus on that, as I believe the Biden administration will do, I think we'll see positive uh, developments. I've, I've often said that um, while the United States, of course, is um, militarily unparalleled in the world and economically uh, the largest and strongest economy in the world, uh, I think its greatest strength 
in foreign policy most certainly uh, lies with its network of alliances and its deep engagement with nations around the world. And that can't be replicated. And it's a, it's a massive strength that the United States has. And uh, we, of course, hope that the Biden administration will continue to appreciate that, recognise it and, and use it um, for the global good. Julie, uh, Mark, what a great conversation. We covered so much ground during uh, our uh, talk of following uh, the uh, remarks made by Dr. Kissinger. I want to thank you so much and want to welcome you to the McCain Institute. Uh, and I know that you'll have so much to offer it. And hopefully uh, we'll see you in person here in Washington uh, once uh, we can travel and, and see each other and, and you know not have to deal with all the things associated with the pandemic. So thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Mark, as well for joining this great conversation. And Thanks, John, for producing the great conversation. Thanks so much for your role. Thanks so much and all stay safe and uh, look forward to catching up in person as soon as we can.